Civics 101 is brought to you in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. If our technology is working, we should next hear a message from our President of the United States. The United States of America welcomes new citizens, along with many gifts you bring and the values you live by. And so I ask that you use your freedoms and your talents to contribute to the good of our nation and the world. You now share the obligation to teach our values to others, to help newcomers assimilate to our way of life, and uplift America by living according to its highest ideals of self-governance. Have you ever been to one of these naturalization ceremonies? No, I haven't. This is where people from other countries become citizens of the U.S., right? Have you? I've been to quite a few, actually. And they follow a certain format. There's a reading of the names of the countries present. Nigeria. There's speeches. Um, everybody takes an oath. Renounce and abjure. Renounce and abjure. All allegiance and fidelity. And then there's usually a technology snafu. A couple minutes once we get the projector warmed up. And then we have the pre-recorded tape of the President of the United States welcoming these new Americans. It's an honor and a privilege to call you a fellow citizen of the United States of America. And the tenor of the speech changes as the President changes, but one thing remains the same. They hand out a bunch of flags and they play this. And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. Lee Greenwood's 1984 hit God Bless the USA, also known as Proud to be an American. I'm very familiar. When did they start doing this? I don't know. I don't know. I called the offices of USCIS, that's the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and I was completely unsuccessful in getting through to a human, any human. The key that you pressed is not a valid choice on this menu. We will play the message for you again. I found a home movie of a naturalization ceremony from the early 1990s, and they played it. This goes back. Yeah, I'm not sure they play that anymore. The last one I went to, they didn't play it. But uh, yeah, it was sort of annoying. I always thought it was annoying. This is Alan Wernick, a CUNY professor and director of Citizenship Now, which is a program that gives free legal assistance to those looking to wave that flag themselves. And while you might need a lawyer's help to become a citizen, you won't to listen to this episode because this is Civics 101. I'm Nick Capodice. I'm Hannah McCarthy. And today we're talking about becoming a U.S. citizen. What was the process back in the day? What is it right now? What do you have to do to sing along with Lee? I know that you're a citizen if you're born on U.S. soil, but if you're not, what is the first thing that you have to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is become a permanent resident, what people call a green card holder. Hold it. What exactly is a green card? It's just a government-issued photo ID that is green in color, and it verifies that you're a permanent resident, that you are allowed to live and work in the U.S. permanently. So anyone who is a permanent resident can become a U.S. citizen. Yes, if they have been here five years, they read and write a certain level of English, they're a person of, quote, good moral character, and if they pass a citizenship test. But speaking English and the test aren't required to get a green card to become a permanent resident. No, they are not. So once you're a permanent resident, citizenship is the breeze? Relatively. So we should have called this episode Becoming a U.S. Permanent Resident. Yes, we should have, but it doesn't quite have the same ring. And there are many ways to live and work here in the U.S. Visas, statuses, but becoming a permanent resident is the path to citizenship. So how do you become a permanent resident? Well, you need a a U.S. citizen or permanent relative who can sponsor you, or you can be sponsored by an employer who uh, can show a shortage uh, of U.S. workers in a job that that employer needs to fill. Uh, You can be outstanding in your field. You You can be a great violinist or scientist. Uh, or you can become an investor. What does it mean to sponsor someone? If you're a U.S. citizen who makes a certain income, you can sponsor a family member or a potential employee. If you're a sponsor, you're vouching for that potential new American. You're saying you're going to support them financially if necessary. And yeah, you can sponsor a worker, but far and away, the most common way to get that green card is through family. Someone who is a U.S. citizen or themselves a permanent resident sponsoring a relative. We call this a family preference system. Can it be any relative? Not any relative. Uh, It can be different types of relatives, but the process is going to be completely different. The wait time is going to be completely different depending on that relationship. 
the quota is based on statute, um, and the statute divides up the family employment-based preference categories. The category for the immediate relatives of U.S. citizens, which is the spouse of a citizen, unmarried child under 21 of a citizen, and the parent of a 21-year-old citizen, there's no limit on the, in, in that category. But in the uh, family and employment-based preference categories, which uh, are divided up based on the type of uh, relationship you have to your employer or your relative, there is a per-country quota of more, no more than 27000 per year from any one country. And typically, no country gets that many every year because of the overall worldwide limit. You said I wouldn't need a lawyer to understand this episode, Nick, and I'm starting to disagree. You're right. I'm sorry. The system is complicated, and you are a native English speaker with a college degree. Imagine navigating it without those two benefits. Many people do use a lawyer, which can cost thousands of dollars, not to mention the $1,000 filing fee. But Alan is breaking down the hierarchy of relationships. Every different category has different limits and thus different wait times. So there's the immediate relative category. If you're a U.S. citizen and you want to sponsor your spouse, your kid, or if you're over 21 years old, your parents, there's almost no wait time and there's no limit. It's almost a guarantee. But the other categories, like a citizen sponsoring their brother or sister, um, depending on the country, it can have a significant backlog. So, for instance, in the brother and sister of a U.S. citizen category, if you're from India, if you're from the Philippines, if you're from Mexico, you could wait 20, 30 years before you qualify for permanent residence in that category. 20 to 30 years? Yes. In some categories, I mean, you're looking at, you know, in the employment-based from India, in some categories, you're looking at, you know, 80 years. So basically, none of the people who would be applying now are, are ever going to come to the United States. Okay, so that's family preference and skill preference, but didn't Alan say there was an investor category? Yes! If you invest a million dollars, 500,000 in some locations actually, if you invest that in a business for a project that will create at least 10 jobs, you can get your residency in about two years. Doesn't matter where you're from. I've always wondered how rich people do it. On one hand, people feel that they're buying their way into the United States to get a green card. Uh, and then later become a U.S. citizen. But it's also controversial. And some people think that the amount is, is too low, that a million dollars is not enough for such a great uh, privilege uh, as becoming a permanent resident of the United States. So I asked Alan what my path is. If I live in another country, I want to become an American citizen, but just like my Italian great-grandfather, I don't have a family in America yet or a job skill that's deemed desirable or a million dollars on hand, how long do I have to wait? There, there's no, there's no, there's, no, there's no way you can become a permanent resident unless you're in one of the categories I described. So it's not a question of how long you wait. It's basically you, you wait forever and you're never going to qualify. But what if you're already here? You're undocumented. You maybe even have family here who could sponsor you. You can eventually become one, right? Yeah. But, well, the thing is, is that if you're undocumented in the United States today, in most cases... The only way you're ever going to become a permanent resident is if you marry a U.S. citizen. All the other options are not available to you. And the reason for that is because if you've been here unlawfully in the United States for more than 180 days, then there's really uh, no other way you're going to be able to become a permanent resident unless you marry a U.S. citizen. So you have to be in one of those categories. And if you're not, there's nothing you can do. Nothing. Many uh, commentators talk about why don't people who are undocumented here get in line. And then ultimately, you got to go home, apply for permanent residency here or citizenship if you want to try and do that, but get in line behind everyone else. But the fact is, uh, for most people around the world, there is no line. All right, so that's how to become a citizen, or rather a permanent resident, today. Is this always how we've done it, family and job preference? Well, immigration laws have changed a lot, many times over the last 230 years. So let's start with our founding. The Constitution says that the Congress shall provide for a uniform law of naturalization. And actually, the Constitution says very little about citizenship at all. This is May Nye. She's a professor of history at Columbia University. 
And the Congress does just that. They write a Naturalization Act of 1790. And then you could become a naturalized citizen if you were a free white person of good moral character. What do those adjectives mean? Well, the free part means that they're not an indentured servant. It also implied that you were not enslaved, although by this time there were no white people in slavery. Well, we think of white being pretty obvious, but it really wasn't that obvious. But it mostly was understood to mean you weren't a a black person because there were free black persons. And for almost 100 years, only white people could be citizens. What did she mean by good moral character? So that that meant that you didn't have a criminal record. So if you were those adjectives, after living in the U.S. for five years, you could become a citizen. After the Civil War, they amended the Naturalization Act because now there was a question of African Americans who had been excluded from the Naturalization Law of 1790. In 1870, Congress passed a new Naturalization Act, which provided naturalization for white persons and persons of African nativity and descent. The interesting thing that happened at the time was that there were some people in the Senate, notably Charles Sumner and some of the other radical Republicans, who said, well, why don't we just get rid of the racial bar completely? Why don't we just say any person can become a citizen after five years? Why do we have to specify white and African? The majority of people in the Senate said, no, 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 no. If you do that, then you'll open the door to Chinese. And we finally get to 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, when Congress passes the first and so far only Immigration Act to restrict immigration based on a specific nationality. How much did it restrict immigration from China? Entirely. It barred any Chinese people from being allowed entry into the U.S., and those who are already here could not become citizens. And this wasn't repealed until 1945, when the U.S. let a whopping 105 Chinese people enter each year. Why did Congress single out that particular country? There are a couple reasons. This is Margaret Chin. She's a sociology professor at Hunter College. One um, had to do with people feared uh, that Chinese immigrants would be taking away jobs. Because right before that, Chinese immigrants also came and they participated in um, mining, searching for gold. They also helped build the railroad. And after the railroad was was finished, they were afraid that they would be taking jobs away from other Americans, mostly white Americans, anywhere in the U.S. The second thing was they were fearful that Chinese immigrants couldn't learn English and couldn't assimilate. And this time, this was our era of peak immigration. Over 12 million new Americans came through Ellis Island, our immigration station that opened in 1892. I read an estimate that 40% of Americans have an ancestor who came through Ellis Island. All right, so during this peak era, are there any restrictions on who can come? Hardly any. They they sent back 2% of the people who showed up at Ellis Island. 2% were sent back. The only people who were sent back from Ellis Island were people who suffered from certain contagious diseases, Uh, suffered from mental illnesses, and, quote, persons who were likely to become a public charge. That included women who had come alone and had no male family member to pick them up in New York. You had to have some money in your pocket. They called it show money. People were advised they should have $15. Sometimes it was $25. It wasn't a huge amount. Um, They just wanted to know that you were going to work. So... It was important that you could walk through the medical inspection line at Ellis Island and not be limping. But this era of massive immigration comes to a screeching halt in 1924. By this law, the number to be admitted henceforth was to be in proportion to the national origin of our country's population. Well, 1924 is when they passed real restrictive um, regulations on immigration, and this is the first time that they impose a numerical limit. The Johnson-Reed Act of 1924 is a quota act for immigration. Limits were set based on the number of people who were already here in the United States, and they based it on the 1890 census from 34 years earlier, before the surge of people from Southern and Eastern Europe. 
And so the quotas gave preference to Northern Europeans. I'm talking Germans, British, Swedes, and the like. And to give you an idea of how much it restricted immigration, let's use the Italians again, um, over 3 million Italians came in a single decade in the early 1900s. But the Johnson-Reed Act restricted it to 4,000 a year. Immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe stops almost entirely. One other crucial thing that happens in 1924 is that Native Americans, who had previously not been allowed at all to become citizens, are all granted U.S. citizenship. When do we start letting people in again? Not until 1965. Lyndon Johnson, at the feet of the Statue of Liberty, signs the Hart Seller Act. This bill says simply that from this day forth, those wishing to immigrate to America shall be admitted on the basis of their skills and their close relationships to those already here. So 1965 was a big year in terms of immigration and immigration law. Here's Margaret Chen again. The Hart Seller Act was passed that year. I guess Kennedy and Johnson and I guess the rest of the world, when they were looking at the U.S., realized that the U.S. wasn't doing what they were saying they would do. They were trying to support the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement was focused on equal treatment, regardless of race or nationality. The immigration policy of the United States has been twisted and has been distorted by the harsh injustice of the national origins quota system. And this is the beginning of our family preference system, where we started. But it's not Eastern Europeans and Italians who are coming anymore. After 1965, with this family preference law, you begin to see huge increases of immigrants from Asia and from Latin America. And that was something that people did not expect. Because the framers of the 1965 law thought that using family preferences, the people who were already in the U.S., which were mostly white um, descendants, would have their family members come. The unintended consequence was that people who, were, who had a small population here who could not move easily back and forth to their home countries to see their family members really wanted to reunite with their family members. And by 2015, 50 years later, whites are 62 percent, Hispanics 18, Asians are 6 percent, and blacks are 13 percent of the population. And Alan and Margaret and May, they all expressed difficulties with how our current system works. But nevertheless, despite all the lawyers and the backlogs and the red tape, every year, about 700,000 new Americans take that oath. And when you watch that ceremony with the knowledge of what many of those people have been through, it's so moving that it makes even Lee Greenwood bear. You are now Well, that is it for this episode on the ever-evolving process of becoming a citizen of the United States. Uh, today's episode was produced by me, Nick Capodice, with you, Hannah McCarthy. Our staff includes Jackie Helbert and Sarah Ernst. Erica Janik is our executive producer and wanted me to keep in a part about the Alien and Sedition Acts. Maureen McMurray considers herself a citizen of the world. Music in today's episode by the ever-reliable Blue Dot Sessions, Chris Zabriskie, Kevin McLeod, Bizou, Young Carts, the Rondo Brothers, Robert John, and Poddington Bear. And... You know who I forgot, Hannah? Oh, Lee Greenwood. Lee. Thanks, Lee. Fair use. Special thanks to Lyra Keller and to the man who taught me more about becoming a citizen than anyone else. He himself is one, Pedro Garcia. Gentle reminder, we are coming up on the deadline for our student contest. Don't forget to have your students submit their 60-second stump speech. You can find more info on that at civics101podcast.org slash contest. Civics 101 is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and it's a production of NHPR, New Hampshire Public Radio.